I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. You know, there, there's a whole message in that. It's a whole message if we are in Christ. You know, we have been, we have been called to grow in our faith. When we became a Christian, the growth in our life in Christ did not become complete just because we walked down the aisle, just because we said a prayer, and it certainly wasn't complete when we were baptized. That just marked only the beginning. And in fact, we need to be growing in our faith every day. The writer of Hebrews was scolding his readers. He was saying in Hebrews 5 verse 12, he says, though by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again. The principles, the first principles of the oracles of God, and you need to come to need milk and not solid food. We need to be active in our growth as Christians. You know, just simply showing up on Sunday morning, warming a pew, if that's all you do, that's not growth. We need to be active in our faith every day. Let me illustrate. For example, one thing I need to do to get healthier and to be physically fit, I need to join a fitness club. I need to go to the gym. Well, you know, let's say for the next six months, I went to the gym every day, and I sat on the machines, and I opened my newspaper up and read. (laughs) You know, I I could actually be reading some health magazines and learning how to eat healthier and learning how to be more active, and I would know more about being healthy, but at the end of six months, I'd probably be a couple pounds more, and certainly not a degree healthier. But I went to the gym every day. I'd at least be pedaling while I was reading, you know. You see, being a Christian, being a Christian does not automatically guarantee growth or change. I've known Christians who have known the Lord for a long time, yet haven't grown much in their faith. I've also known others who have just met the Lord recently and they have grown by leaps and bounds. They know the Lord and they surpass others in their maturity and knowledge of God. The fact is we are living in a fast-growing society. But this is one in today's world where there's very little inward growth. We're in a society that's struggling with addiction, People who have been hurt and unable to get beyond their past. And we're just talking about the church, much less than the rest of society. This series that I'm starting today, Putting on the New Man, we're we're going to be considering what does it mean to grow in Christ, to be what God is calling us to be so that we have an impact on the culture rather than the culture having an impact on us. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to be working through these passages in chapter 4 and chapter 5 over the next few weeks, talking about what it means to put on the new man. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 24 And uh, uh, earlier, Austin read pretty much a parallel passage over in Colossians. This this passage will say much of the same things. Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the frutality of their mind. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. 
but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness." Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, as we look at your word and as we read, Lord, give us understanding and have us to see what you would have us to become as we put on the new man that is from you. Lord, move in our midst, touch everyone that is here. May Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Today we're reading about putting on the new man and you know we're coming to this table here in a minute and we're going to we're, we're going to be remembering what Jesus has done for us so that we could put on the new man. I had to think about this earlier and I added a note earlier and I, I, I said you know we serve a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. Where else can you get a complete do-over that we can put on, put off all that we once were and put on everything new that we're seeing as a new creation before God? You know, there are several terms the Bible talks about putting on the new man. Jesus put it in, it's, it's talking about one's conversion. Jesus said over in John 3, uh, verse 7, He says, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. It's all about becoming new. Once an individual has been born again and belonged to Christ, Paul goes over and over in the, uh, his letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians five seventeen. he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And Paul, writing to the Ephesians from his imprisonment in Rome, remember this is one of the prison epistles, Paul is in prison, and within a few years he will be executed. But he is writing from prison in Rome, and he's reminding them of the things that they should live as Christians. And the term Paul uses here, he used it in, over in the letter to the Colossians, that uh, Austin read earlier, but in Ephesians 4.22 and 24, he says that you put off the old man and that we are to put on the new man. Talking to believers, Paul is saying that we are to take off the old man. That word to take off is the same word in the Greek that we would use to take off a cloak, to take off the shed dirty clothes. We are to shed the old ratty and smelly clothes and put on a new man, like putting on fresh, clean clothes. You know, we understand that analogy. And we, we, we understand the picture that Paul is given here. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We like our old clothes. Ellen's forever telling me, you know, those shirts that have been sitting in our closet for 20 years I haven't worn I've Got to get rid of them. Got to get rid of our old clothes. We like our old clothes. They're broken in. They're comfortable. We move around well in those old clothes. Now, I'm going to pick on Darian again. And Darian, forgive me. Uh, he makes for some great sermon illustrations. I picked them up after football practice. And on the way home, we're rolling down all the windows in my truck. You see, after two and a half hours, that aroma of two and a half hours of a hard workout in the hot sun can overcome you. <laughs> and when I get home, you know, I tell, I tell Darian, the first thing I need you to do is go down and take a shower and put something clean on. And, and, and Darian go, well, why? <laughs> Duh, you know. Uh, it, it's just, you know, there's a commercial for a well-known air freshener. And the question they ask is, have you gone 
nose blind. Have you seen that commercial? <laughs> Have you gone nose blind? Well, that's the way we are. Oftentimes, we go nose blind to the old clothes, to the old man that we have on. We can't see it because it's comfortable. We're used to it. We've left on, we might have taken some off, but we've left the old ones on. You know, I've kicked the shoes off, but boy, those socks still need a workout, okay? It's, it's, and we don't notice that they stink. We've gone nose blind. In this letter to the Ephesians, Paul is taking his time as we go through this letter and explaining the work of Christ in our lives. So I want to put this in perspective because he starts off by saying, therefore, he's drawn a conclusion. And Paul talks about our calling in Christ. Over in Ephesians 1.18, he says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. We might understand our calling. What are the riches of the glory? of his inheritance in the saints and we have been made alive in Christ Lee just sang about that alive in Christ Ephesians 2 1 he says and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins we've been made alive we were created for good works Ephesians 2 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them and in chapter 4 uh, Paul explains how God has given the church gifted people to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that in Ephesians 4:14 4, that we should be no longer that we be no longer be children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting You've heard me talk about this a good bit of the New Testament as warnings against false teachers. And this is one such warning. And because of all of these things, all of these things, Paul tells us in verse 17, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Gentiles here talks about the rest of the world. In the Jewish mind, there's only two people in the world. There's the Jews and there's the Gentiles. But here, he's grouping probably a good bit of the Jews in with the Gentiles because you're now Christian. You belong to Christ. And so the use of the word Gentiles talking about the rest of the world. He says, we should no longer walk as the rest, as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. We are not to walk the way the rest of the world is walking because the rest of the world knows nothing of God and much less of Jesus. We were once like the rest of the world. Every one of us. I don't care if you grew up in a church home, you know, and you grew up praising Jesus. There had to come a time when you changed from being like the rest of the world to knowing Christ individually. We were once like the rest of the world, dead in our sins and in our trespasses, as we read back there at Ephesians 2, 1. And it says that the rest of the world, in the futility of their mind, the emptiness of their mind, the world believes they are enlightened. But the fact is, they are actually in the dark. They have no useful aim or goal, heavenly speaking, and or that in the eyes of God. Everything that the world does in the eyes of God is in futility. I don't care how good it looks to man. What matters is how it looks to God. He goes on to explain, talking about the rest of the world, but talking about the Gentiles. He says in Ephesians 4, 18 and 19, he says, having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart who be in past feeling have been given, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Their understanding, their understanding is dark from God's perspective. And they are ignorant. They are ignorant of the things of God. Why? Because of the blindness of their hearts. 
Uh, most of the other translations will say the hardness of their heart. They have hardened their hearts not to take in the things of God. The things of God is just so much foolishness to them, and they want no part of it. They choose, they choose to harden, it, harden their heart. They choose their hearts to be blind. And it goes on saying, being past feelings, their conscience has quit. In fact, other translations will have the word callous. They have become callous. You know, when you work hard and you're, and you're using your hands, you build up calluses. You know, things don't hurt anymore because you've been calloused. They have been calloused over. Nothing bothers them. They are shameless. And in fact, they're not just shameless, they brag about all their lewdness, lewdness or immorality. The Holman Christian Standard translates this word as promiscuity. They're, they have loose morals. They are immoral. And uncleanliness, meaning all the impure things. Impure, as far as God is concerned, you know, we chuckle about the things that we get away with. And the, the, and the world brags about it. And it's all done in greediness. Greediness. I, I like the NIV. They translate that. It says the continued lust for more. Whether it be lewdness, uncleanliness. Uh, all these things, they want more and more. And you know what? The world isn't satisfied. They can get more and more, but they are never satisfied. Paul is describing the works of the flesh. The world are slaves to their fleshly desires. Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21, we know 22 and 23, those are the fruits of the Spirit. But what are the fruits of the flesh? 19, 21, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, there's that word lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, uh, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, robberies, and the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the rest of the world. That's where we came from, every one of us. We came from that. That is the world all around it. The world is all about what's in it for them. But here's the key word that's left in the middle of it. Going back to verses 18 to 19, it says, being alienated, being alienated from the life of God, being separated from Him. You know what happens when you're separated from God? The more you're separate, the more you become separate. That gap gets larger and larger. They are separate from God, and they either don't know it, or worse yet, they don't care. They are dead people. They're dead. They just don't know it. And here again, neither do they care. But the Christian is different. Those that are in Christ, we live connected to God through Jesus. Jesus said he is the life. He didn't say I am a life. You know that passage, John uh, 14 verse 6, I repeat it all the time. Uh, Jesus said I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say I am a life. He said I am the life. You don't have Jesus, you don't have life. And because we have found life that is only found in Jesus, how do we live? According to Paul in Romans 8 1, he says we do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Because we have a Spirit that we can hear, we have a Spirit that we can follow. And Paul goes on to say to those Christians in Ephesus, moving on to Ephesians 4 verse 20, he says, but you have not so learned Christ. Interesting, he didn't say he didn't so much learn about Christ. We've, we've got a lot of people in this world that knows all about Jesus but they do not know him. In fact, that word learned in the Greek, we could just easily, just as easily translate that experience. But those of us who have experienced 
experienced Jesus. Or we have learned through our experience with Jesus. We don't merely learn about him, but we have experienced him. We have experienced the fullness of Christ through his Holy Spirit. And none of these things that we have just talked about, none of those things are evident in Christ. They belong to the world. Ephesians 4, verses 20 to 21, he says, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Indeed, assuming that they, in fact, have heard him. Have heard him. We have heard him, those that are in Christ, we hear him speak. We hear him speak through his word. We hear him speak as he as his word is being illuminated. We have heard and we have been taught by him. When we possess the Holy Spirit, we experience firsthand teachings of Jesus through his word. We have direct access to the truth. And the truth is not an abstract idea. The truth is a person. Here again, John 14, uh, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is not a truth. He is the truth. We have access to the absolute truth in the universe through Jesus. When we have Jesus, we know the truth. And you know, if we have the truth, when we look out on the world our viewpoint of the world changes. Things that we once saw look differently now. You know, we don't look at the things in the culture the same way we used to see them. Our desires will change. Our conscience have been resensitized against the evils that we were once so used to. We begin to smell the old clothes, okay? Our, 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 our nose blindness starts going away. The old sinful, the old man still continues to nag us though. But we make that conscious choice every day, every hour. And sometimes it has to be made moment by moment to follow the leading of the Spirit. To keep that old clothes, to keep that old, old man taken off and not to put it back on, because we have the new man. Paul goes on to say in Ephesians uh, 4.22, and he says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the way we used to live, concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Those that have the old man grow corrupt uh, more and more every day. Now, you say, well, there are a lot of good people out there. We have to, here again, we have to understand what good means. Good in our eyes or good in the eyes of God. And it's only good in his eyes that matter. And so we start, we start to put on, as we are in Christ, we start to see things how he sees things. They may be good in accordance to the world, but it may be filthy in accordance with God. You understand, we don't do anything good as a Christian. We do not do anything good before we become Christian. We only do good according to God when it's His Spirit working through us. When it's His Spirit walking, working through us. And here Paul is saying that we have some human responsibility here. We have to choose to put off the old sinful nature man and, and we have to choose not to act like the rest of the world any longer. Paul tells us in Romans that our old man was crucified in Christ. Lee sang about that. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The old nature, the old man, will grow more corrupt every day. We must rid ourselves of it. You know what? <laughs> I'm not stupid. That's easier said than done, isn't it? Especially when those old clothes are so attractive and so comfortable. It's easier said than done. 
But Paul goes on to say in verse 23, he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's an ongoing process. We have to continually to renew our minds. Now we got some data programmers, uh, computer programmers, David in the back. You know, he deals with ones and zeros. You know, sometimes we got to take that computer that's corrupt. We got to run that antivirus, don't we? Sometimes we've got to reboot it. And sometimes we've got to just reload the programs. We take off the old corrupt programs. We got to put on the new pure programs. It's the same way with our minds. We've got to stop feeding our minds, our data processor, which is our minds, the data from the world. Our minds need to be rebooted, rebooted and reprogrammed with the things of God. Romans 12 verse 2, you know this verse. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing, the reprogramming, if you will, of your mind that you may prove what is good, that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? And we start to see things as God sees them, not as the world sees them. Our w- minds need to be removed, renewed. And as we become renewed, we become less and less nose blind. We'll begin to see more and more how much our old man and our old nature, how much it really stinks. <laughs> And we want to take them off and leave them off and put them in the trash heap. We want more and more, we want less and less of the old ways and we want more and more of the clean and fresh and godly ways, those godly clothes. Verse 24, and it says that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We were created... In the image of God. But you know, in in the history of man, that has become marred, that has become torn, and it's become stained. By putting on the new man, we have become a new creation, and the image of God is being restored. When we put on Christ, when we are in Christ, that image of God is being restored to what God has intended. And he intended from the beginning that we be in fellowship with him, which is done in his righteousness and in his holiness. Taking off the old man and putting on the new man. Got news for you. This is nothing that we can do ourselves. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We must rely and trust Jesus to make the changes. What happens is we're often so tempted to put on those old stinky clothes because we are so used to them. We must choose to turn to Jesus every day. We have to get up in the morning choosing Jesus. We have, we, you know, if we're going to face temptations. It's not a question of if, it's when. When we face those temptations, we have to choose Jesus. It's an ongoing process. We cannot do it alone. We need Jesus. Jesus said over in John fifteen five. he says, Without me, you can do nothing. We're going to sing a hymn here in a minute without him. We're going to have a Lord's Supper here in just a moment. Remembering what he has done for us so that we could put on the new man. So that we can be new before him. We get to do a do-over. It might not count to the rest of the world, but it counts in the eyes of God. I get to start new with him. I love 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, in Christ, we become a new creation. All the old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. Have we put on the new man? Are we still struggling with the old that we're struggling with? As we come to him and as we come to this Lord's table this morning... You know, we're, we're, coming, we're coming to remember just what Christ has done for us. This table is all about remembering. And when we come to the table, we need to have the new man on. 
we shouldn't have anything unconfessed. We need to be preparing in our hearts to come before the table. This table is not Rosemont's table. This is the Lord's table. This table is open to all here who have publicly confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So as we come this morning, we're going to sing without him. But this is a time to get yourself right. You know, Paul tells us that we're going to examine ourselves, that we take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. Is there anything that's left unconfessed? Is there an old garment that we have left on? This is our opportunity to be straight between, uh, between us and God. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we come before you lifting up our very souls before you, that you examine us, that you show us where we have been lacking. And Lord, that we may confess these things, that we can lay them before the cross, that we can leave them at the cross, that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness that we can be the new man that you have called us to be. Lord, may your spirit move among us this morning. May we feel your very presence, and may Jesus be glorified in this place today. For we pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.